Welcome, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Higher Calling Podcast. This is Pete Newsom, and I'm joined with Ricky Baez once again, and we are your source for all things hiring, staffing, and recruiting. Ricky, welcome back. How are you today? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing really good. It's been a very interesting week, but uh, if it wasn't interesting, then why do I do this job? That's right. That's <laughs> right. Well, we, we have to first go back to our last podcast how we ended talking about friday the 13th did you make good on your plan to watch watch the movies that night absolutely i did i saw part one two my and my favorite part three um over on uh, on amazon prime now we gotta send them a bill because they're not they're not active sponsors for the show um but i saw that on amazon prime and man it's just it's old it's cheesy the cgi is non-existent but man it still is a good scare really fun it's it's not the best acting right <laughs> like that's, that's we we watched part three and it, you know great jump scares yeah but the 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 voices the tone the inflection it's just uh, the all-around terrible acting i i don't i don't know if what 30 years ago now what 40 years ago 40 years yeah. 40 that that dates me by the way <laughs> um but 40 years ago people were actually talking to each other that way but um it, it wasn't pretty that part of it anyway no no it, it it was not but you know what 40 years that tells you something about a piece of art that 40 years later st people still jump there's some movies that are five years old like five years ago nobody cares about but 40 years later i mean that one is still doing what it was intended to do like the franchise the right i mean yeah. it's 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 <laughs> solid and you know the one the reason we watch is my 13 year old wanted to watch it so you know they you know it's not like i was forcing it on him and now he wants to watch all of them which is a bit that's a, that's a little more of a commitment than I wanted to. i'm like dude we gotta we gotta relegate it to you know Friday the 13th and, and we'll watch them then, but I can't, I can't do a whole series. And they get progressively worse. He went to space. He also went to Manhattan. I mean, right. <laughs> they, get, they get really worse. So ne next year, watch, you know, uh, Friday the 13th, Jason has COVID. There's <laughs> another one. Yeah, exactly. That's probably, that's probably next. Well, in the meantime, we can, we have a lot to talk about today because we left off in our last episode talk leading right up to the, interview room so to speak and we promise to come back which we'll do today and talk about what happens once you're in the room yes. so i'll i'll ask you you know you're the you're the hr guy you interview people very often i'll you know have for many years what's the first thing that you want to recommend to candidates so now we've got everybody from the research to the car getting into the general area a little bit early and then walking in about 10 minutes early so here's the first thing that I, that, that I um, advise people to do is now that you've researched and you know how many people, give or take, that you're going to interview, bring extra resumes. If you know four people are going to be there for a panel interview, bring eight resumes because you, you, you never know who else is going to be added later on. So you always want to be prepared. One of the things I do, Pete, when I interview people, I don't just focus on the interview itself. Well, I mean, I, I do, but not just the questions, but I look at the whole experience. And if I see somebody just doesn't bring a resume, it's not prepared, um, is really distracted. Yeah, those do, in, my, in, in my book, those are points off understanding that they might be nervous as well but i start off with making sure that i advise bring extra resumes well like so many of the things that we end up talking about in conversations like this it's preparation and it sends a message and you, you can send one of preparation and interest or you can send one of you know apathy right and and so what we know is candidates don't intend to send that message and they may be extremely interested, but when you're being compared to the field, so to speak, you, you want to take that extra step and that's an easy yes. one. So out of the gate, bring extra resumes, no ifs, ands, or buts, plan ahead and, and just print them out in advance. Absolutely. On now, paper. here we we're, it's always with the paper. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, I'm just perfume, saying, perfume on the paper, no perfume on the paper, but good, heavy stock, you know, because once everything is over, 
we are going to be reviewing each resume, right? And it, it, it's, it's what if you're neck and neck with somebody else, you never know, maybe the thing that tips you over is that nice stock of paper, that extra mile of tender loving care that that candidate really put into the whole process. That's just me. So as a professional recruiter, I'm going to tell you, I, I'm going to take issue with the call that I get that says, we would have hired your candidate, but their paper wasn't thick enough. It, was, it wasn't heavy enough, right? So, touche, touche, fair enough. But perception being reality, you know, you, you, you know these, these are the kind of things that would never be stated, but, you know, maybe it's subconscious, right? You know, and, and I, 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 I will concede, I will fully concede that holding a resume on heavy stock versus, you know, flimsy you know, paper, you do notice a difference, right? Yes. I don't know that I would ultimately make the difference, and, 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 but if everything was that eagle or that even perhaps, but, uh, err on the side of doing that, do not put your picture on the resume though. Can we Don't agree? Can we agree on that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely do agree with that. And you know what? That's a good point though, Pete. That really is a good point because the first time I saw a picture and address birth dates, religions on a resume, I thought somebody was playing a joke on me. But once I started asking more questions to colleagues, and I quickly found out that in other countries, that's perfectly okay. Other countries, that's okay. So if we have a candidate that is, is brand new to the US, and they give you that kind of a resume, you know, it, instead of getting into crazy shock or cardiac arrest, like I did, <laughs> I just, I, it, it's, it's just, it's a good idea to take a step back and maybe think that maybe in other countries and other cultures, that's perfectly okay. But here in the United States for EEO laws, that's a big no, no. Understood. So, yeah. you know, as a candidate, don't, I think the message there is don't put your interviewer in an uncomfortable situation there unnecessarily, you right? That's right. Stay, you know, shoot in the middle with things like that. And when in doubt, you know, if you're having to question whether something's appropriate to be on a resume, you should probably leave it off. Now, that's not that's, the, right. that's not our core focus today, but that's never were you know, a bad thing to uh, to use as a reminder. Um, you know that that resume is like so many things. You you don't you only get one shot at it. Yep. So of course, we've already talked about making sure that you have someone proofread it, that you you think hard and and long about what's on there. So. Uh, don't make your interviewer uncomfortable ne unnecessarily. So that's a good, that's a good message. A little, a bonus tip, if you will. That's right. Today. Right. right. All right. So the next thing, so the what, next what are you going to go with? So he, so now you're ready. You got that resume, turn off any distractions you may have, be it your cell phone, your, your smartwatch, anything you have that can take your attention away from the interview from that pitch that you're going to make about the skill set you bring to the organization. And look, we get it. We live in a world where we are connected 24 seven, right? It's, it's especially right now, August, you know, it, it's August on 2021. We're at a time that we have to be in touch with everybody at the same time immediately. But when it comes to making that really good first impression um, for your uh, it, for this next venture in your career, eliminate those things. Turn off your phone. More importantly, take off your smartwatch. Here's why. With this one, I'm really, really particular, in, uh, Pete, because I've been in my entire HR career, I've been in, in a lot of conversations, especially interviewing or from an employee relations perspective, investigations. And as soon as smartwatch started getting more relevant, when somebody would send me a text, an email that goes to my watch, the first thing I do, I look at it. And if I look at my watch, when I'm talking to, to somebody, it sends the message that A, I don't care, or B, I'm just not that interested in that conversation. So eliminate that kind of distraction, just take your watch off. Yeah, lo looking, looking at a watch in, in general, in any conversation is a bad sign, unless unless the, the, the person or people you're with are going somewhere with you next and you're all in on it together, it's a terrible message, right? And so in an interview that is, you know, and, and I'll tell you, if I'm, if I am on the other side of the table and I see the interviewer looking at a watch, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to assume as a candidate that things aren't going real well. Right. Or I will say as a, as a professional, you know, being a professional recruiter, uh, you know, I've also been a professional salesperson at the same time. And I know in a client meeting, if things aren't going well, if they're looking at, at their watch, I, I better change up real quick. So that, that's for another day. But for this purpose, 
you don't want to you know do anything that's going to serve as a distraction. And you know, my my wife is often the person in the room who has still has a ringer on their phone. I think there's like maybe 50 people that don't have it on vibrate all the time. She's one of them. And so when we walk into, you know, something at school, you know, for, for a church, if we're at a concert, it's going to be quiet. Right. I, I, I like, you gotta, you gotta turn your phone off. Right. It, it, because you do not want to be that person. And I'm happy to say so far, so good. She's never been awesome. the one that, that everyone looks at, right. To see who's fumbling in, in the room, you know, who, you know, that scene, it's yeah. awful. <laughs> And, um, you know, it just, it just sends a bad signal and, yeah. and, and that's what this is all about. So great tip, turn everything off better yet, leave it in the car. There we go. Leave it in the car. Uh, remember the car you drove in about a half hour early, hanging down in the parking lot until it's time to, uh, to, uh, to go in all that right. car, so, yes. so th that very same one. All right. So we got the resumes, we got all the electronics that, that, that you're turning them off, Pete. This next one is really crucial in my book because, you know, what's more important than the things you say in an interview is what you don't say, is your nonverbal cues. So this next tip is to practice really good verbal, I mean, nonverbal behavior. Good eye contact, sitting up straight, not slouching over. Don't get too, too comfortable once you walk in. And that is as soon as you walk in not necessarily in the interview meeting, but as soon as you walk into the building, because you want to make sure that everybody you make contact with, that you make a really good impression on, because you never know if the, the hiring authority is going to ask of the, uh, the advice of the front desk person, the door person, security, even the janitor, you never know if they're going to ask them what kind of an interaction they had with you. So practice good nonverbal behavior. And the most important one there, Pete, in my opinion, it's a really good handshake. Have you ever shaken somebody's hand and they give you what they call the dead fish? I have indeed. <laughs> and I, I won't, I won't name names with this because it would okay. be inappropriate to do okay. so. Okay. But in, let's just say in my circle of, of, of professional acquaintances and friends, there was one person in particular who's known to give a dead fish. And I, I would love if, if some of those friends heard this you know, very comment because they'll know exactly who I'm talking about and I will receive you know, text messages immediately you know, with, with the name. But this is a person who is synonymous with a dead fish handshake. And it's so easily avoidable. Um, there's really no excuse to do it. And, and, it, and it just is creepy. It, is, it's, you know, it gives a bad vibe. Right. And in, in American culture, you know, and specifically in American business culture, that head, that handshake is meaningful. It yeah. sets a tone and it's it's not about gender. It's not about, you know, age. It's about, you know, how you present yourself uh, you know, at first pass. And whether you you think it should or not is I'll say is irrelevant because yep. we know that it does. Uh, and, and, and if you're playing the odds, you don't want to take chances with that unnecessarily. Um, so have a, have a solid handshake. Now, big caveat though, right? We're in times of COVID. You may not want to. So if you're a dead fish guy listening and you know who you are, which I assume you don't, fist bump everyone. You're, you, you get a <laughs> free pass. <laughs> the, you know, you know, COVID is, is, has been you know, tragic and, and awful for every reason. So, um, you know, and you, if you, this guy in particular, you know, may find a silver lining there to fist bump. But um, I don't think that's, that's something to shy away from in any way if you're less than comfortable giving a handshake. Do you disagree with that? No, I do not disagree at all. It, it, it's, it's, it's just good to practice and make sure that you don't put yourself and everybody else who's hands you shake in that particular uh, situation when they feel uncomfortable, especially now during COVID, um, follow what they do. If they don't lean in for any kind of contact, you don't lean in. That's fine. So just follow what they do. Uh, but fist bump, it's appropriate if you see them doing it first. So just follow their lead. Cause... What's your take on the on the elbow? Uh, because I have an opinion on that, but I want to hear yours first. So I, I I saw that for the first time about three weeks ago, like, it, you know, like the whole chicken wing elbow looking thing. It's just, it's just to me looks odd, but look, if I have a room full of executives that that's how they want to do it, that's fine. I don't know. You seem closer to them, right? If the whole point is so you don't get too close and you can social distance, even a handshake is farther away, but an elbow, aren't you cutting that distance in half? 
That's an excellent point. I don't, I don't know that anyone's, anyone's questioning about it, questioning that they should, mm. I see it as it, it, it's impossible to maintain any sense of dignity when you're doing the elbow <laughs> thing. And the only time I really see it, I swear it's, 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 let's say people who are, uh, um, you know, in later stages of life seem to enjoy it. Like they seem to enjoy doing it, which I, 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 I just don't get. Um, so are you saying that people who are in a certain point in their life that they go buy a Corvette and also they like to uh, elbow bump? Yeah. That's what yeah. I'm hearing. And they, <laughs> okay. and they eat dinner at, at, you know, before sundown. Yes. <laughs> yes. Got it. Got it. Got it. I, I mean, my parents, you know, and their friends at their retirement community probably, you know, probably like give it they're probably listening so i'm sure you guys are wonderful and, and the entertainment that you do out there is great but um that is a certain certain you know group um you know of retirees and they like they, they probably like elbow uh, bumping which is so far off topic at this point i, I don't even know what <laughs> i was we're waiting about. for you to bring that up <laughs> but yeah i'm the one that keeps us in line so yeah so if you're gonna hand if you're gonna shake with your hand do it firmly That's look right. look look the person in the eye those nonverbal cues, as you're talking about, really do send a, a, a message. Uh, just, just like what we were um, referring to earlier, it's one of interest or lack thereof. Right. Um, it's one of seriousness or, or lack of. So, you know, think about it, right? Look in the mirror ahead of time. You know, practice your handshake if you're going to do that. If you're out of practice, and in in, in um, you know in 2021, we are out of practice with a lot of things that happen mm -hmm. in person. So you may need to you know, refresh that a little bit and, and that's okay. Um, what's not okay is to send a bad signal that you could avoid sending. That's right, that's right. And you know, it, it, it's all this is, Pete, and you know this, it's, and this is more for the audience, it's marketing. You are selling yourself, you're selling your, you've never seen McDonald's put a, 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 a um, uh, half baked type of a uh, commercial. They really put everything out. So you really want to make sure that you market yourself, you present yourself in the best light that you want them to to see you. And you would hate for you not to get a position. I mean, going back to the resume thing, it, it, just because of that one small aspect, right? right. So, I've been and 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 for the record, we've we've seen that happen, right? The person was slumped in their chair the whole time. The person refused to make eye contact. Um, the person spoke so softly that um, you know, we, couldn't, we couldn't hear them. And, and this is a good segue into mm -hmm. the next point, which is you know, speak confidently and show enthusiasm through the interview. And I, I think those are, those are tied together. While that's a verbal cue, right? That, that's a very meaningful one. Um, how you come across how, you know, with your tone and inflection speaks volumes. It just does, right? It does. You know, in and I've been I've been in many, many situations as a recruiting manager where I'm really excited about how a resume was put together. I'm like, wow, this is really good. I cannot wait to meet this person. And then I built this 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 persona up in my head. They come in and they're just really monotone. Here's my skill set and here's what's happening. And I'm like, oh, it's just completely killed my entire now again that's on me because i built that persona into my head but it's crucial if you speak confidently with enthusiasm about the skill set you have they want to see it's i don't know about I'm, actually i think i can speak for you here p correct me if i'm wrong when i want to hire somebody i want to bring somebody who's excited to be here i don't want anybody that just that just rolled out of out of bed I want them excited. I want them to be as excited about this opportunity as I am about their resume and finally getting that best, that final piece into the organization. Now, a lot of people might argue, Pete, that why should that matter? If they got the skill sets, then how they communicate that skill set should not matter. And this is why I'm saying it does, because if you have a team full of, I don't want to say extroverts because this is not an extrovert versus introvert thing, but if you have a team full of people, that that they 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 live the culture a specific way the uh, company culture in a specific way and they're high energy and you bring somebody in solely on their skill set but they don't communicate the skill sets with they don't communicate well they don't mesh well with the chemistry of the team you're going to do more harm than good it, well there's it, it goes in a lot of different directions right where, yeah. where there's subjectivity in the in the job in in the interview process you know soft skills you know team fit culture fit 
um, yeah, that's huge. Now there's some jobs where uh, they're more objective in nature and how you're going to assess the quality of a candidate and where the personality may, may not be relevant. So I think we, we do need to clarify that, but, yep. but in most cases, most jobs, it's going to be a factor and probably a significant one. And enthusiasm makes up for a lot of weaknesses in other areas. Yeah. And, you know, that is my personal feeling as well as one that we see translated in the marketplace very regularly where, um, you know, you, you can have flaws uh, in your background, you can have flaws in your skill set, but, and those can be taught, right? Those can be improved, but a flaw in your personality, you know, the core of who you are, or I'll say the interest you have in the job is not something an employer wants to try to fix or teach. Uh, the smart employers know that they can't and don't want to try. So if, if back to this idea of, you know, things being equal, you know, we start to add up a lot of things that, that, that make a difference, right? That yeah. have absolutely nothing to do with skill and background or education, certifications, whatever they may be. And if, I, I, you know, I'll say from, from the staffing perspective, you, I'd like to hear your opinion from an HR perspective and all the hiring I've seen, I would see personality, enthusiasm, the way someone presents himself in an interview makes the difference more so than the background and skill set because you already have that to whatever degree is necessary to get in that final interview, right? So that is not what's usually being assessed at that point. Maybe in the world of, of technical interviews or you know, very specific skill sets that are needed, sure, right? We already, we already put that caveat in place that where objectivity is all that matters, fine. But that's pretty rare, right? Even even on a, on a team where a technical skill set is what's needed, they they want to they, you know, they want to be like you know, the person be likable. They want to get along. They want them to want to be there. Yes, right. That and that that's going to come across in in your tone and in how you show yourself in the interview for sure. Actually, you and I talked about this about a month ago. We were at the office having a conversation about about it, it, it's it's whether it's a skill situation or whether it's a motivational situation, right? Uh, because when, when, when I see somebody who has an amazing resume, right, and, and, and they, they, they speak with that level of enthusiasm, you know what, I'll take it back. Let's not talk about an amazing resume. Let's say that they don't have all the skills that, that, that I'm looking for, but they have at least meet the minimum qualifications of the job. But if I see that they're hungry and they're willing to learn and they have that work ethic, I can bring them in. I'll teach them FMLA. I'll teach them ADA. I'll teach them everything about unions because they're hungry. They have enthusiasm. They're willing to learn. They have a fire you can't teach. Right. Because if I'm going to come in and teach somebody how to work hard, I I'm wasting my time. That's that that ship has sailed. So to me, from from my perspective, if somebody meets that minimum qualifications and they're eager, they're hungry, they're willing to learn, more than likely, I'm going to give that person that shot versus somebody who's got five degrees. Now, it depends on the situation, right? You know, because if you got a, a safety sensitive job, you, you, you have to watch other things like a doctor and because you would hate. The doctor that's working on your heart, you would hate to know that he was he 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 was hired because he met the minimum qualification, but he had an amazing personality, right? That's not what you want. <laughs> it's right? not gonna cut it. It's not no, not no, no not, pun intended. But that's <laughs> yeah, that's not I saw what you did there. I, I didn't mean to do it. I wish I could claim that I did, but I didn't. No. No, but I agree with you, Pete. It's it's it, it's that enthusiasm is crucial in communicating what you have. And look, you spent all this time putting your your career together, building this arsenal of knowledge that you want to um, monetize for this organization. You got to make sure you got a good quote unquote marketing plan to communicate those things and get the client, your employer, to be that much more excited to bring you on board. One hundred percent. So from an HR perspective and a staffing perspective, we're, we're going to tell you that's the top of the list. For Absolutely. Of what's most important. It, you know, you can make up for a lot of a lot of bad by uh, by by showing that enthusiasm. So. Honesty. Mm. Right. Honesty is the best policy. We, we know it. that mm -hmm. it should be the only policy. We you know, we should say that, <laughs> too. Right. True. But is there ever a time to be less than honest in an interview? There's never a time, <laughs> no, okay. you, you, but, but how you communicate that honesty, I think makes a world of a difference. 
Okay, so we're so we're bringing this up, right? I wanted to see how you answered that, yeah. but yeah. we're covering this topic specifically because there's a there's a there's a decent chance. I, I don't want to guess at a percentage. I, I often will make them up, but I won't do that now. But there is some percentage of folks that's 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 not an insignificant number who have been terminated from a former job. Um, you know, been fired. Uh, not by their choice. They've been asked to leave. Um, they haven't met you know, the expectations and they would have a less than favorable reference from that organization. Now, whether, whether that reference is going to be uh, given or, or, or not, there's a good chance you may be asked for why you left a job. So when you've left because you were fired, you were forced to leave. Yeah. How, how do you answer that? <laughs> so it's, I, I, so I'm pausing here. Right, because I want to make sure that I say the right thing for the audience because I have it in my head, Pete, but I want to make sure it comes out perfect. So here's the thing. You definitely don't want to lie. You don't. But you want to pose your answer, honestly, in a position to where it helps you the very best it possibly can in this interview process. So if that question comes up, so let's say, for example, I got fired because performance, whatever it is, right? I got fired for that. And the interviewer asked me that. It's like, so why did you leave that last position? Let me tell you what not to do. Don't lie and say you left. And don't lie and say you got laid off. People will find out. Especially in today's day and age with social media, with Facebook, with, with, with LinkedIn. People know each other in this community. Right. So you've got big time leaders who go golfing and have drinks with other big time leaders and they talk about what kind of uh, how their business is running and the topic is going to come up. Hey, I, ju I just hired somebody that just came from your organization. They said that they left and like, no, he got fired. I don't care how well you did in that interview. You just lied and they caught you in it and they can let you go whether you've been there for five days or five years. They can let you go for that, especially in Florida, which is an employment at will state. So it's it, well, it's never something you'd want to you know get caught in your hand in the cookie jar, yes. right? That goes without saying. Um, you know, it, the, there there are delicate situations out there, and they needed to be treated individually. So we can't really give a blanket answer to what has to be a very specific and pointed question. I, I'll tell candidates if you're working with a, a recruiter, and it's one of the advantages to working with a third party recruiter. And, and, and I want to specify that I, I mean someone, you know, not employed by the, the, the company you're considering going to work for. So a third party like Four Corner, um, you know, be as open and, and honest as you can, because we're you know, very proficient. We're, we're very skilled at, at, at positioning those things and putting them in the best light. And you know, one, just a quick example, we like to present potential problems and challenges at the forefront front of submitting a candidate. Um, because if there's any bad, we want to get it out of the way up front, right? Bad news early is good news. We believe in that. We try to operate that way all the time. So if we know that there's that potential risk of something that's going to come up and we we're in, we know about it, right? So we have to know first. So right. you know, candidates be open with your third party recruiters for sure. Then we'll position it in the best light, which is often much, much easier to do than a candidate doing it themselves. Yeah. You know, similar to having discussions about compensation or, or things that um, you know, can be sensitive or touchy in any way. For us, they're commonplace. It's what we do all day, every day. So it's very easy for us to, to position anything that's potentially negative. So be open with your third party recruiter if you have one. If you don't, you really need to consider the situation individually. And as you know, we certainly want to make clear, don't lie, but you know, think of the best way to uh, position yourself, the experience, what happened, try to find a positive learning opportunity out of it. That if you were fired, one of, I'll tell you, one of the, one of the folks we placed um, years ago, it's a story that I'll never forget. Um, she actually had um, and had, you know, a, a pretty significant crime that was on her background and the, le the, the, she, she wrote a letter to explain it. And the, the story was one of, of, of some, you know, a, a big growing up learning experience from something that happened when this candidate was younger. And I will say not only did that candidate get hired, but was one of the best employees, you know, this organization ever, ever hired because of, of who they were. And, you know, we evolve, we change, we grow. Everyone knows that. And I will say, if I look at all of our clients you know, that we've worked with in our 16 years in business, 
I don't know that any have been unrealistic about those things. You know, certain mm-hmm. organizations have policies that are necessary for their type of business, but you know, and maybe it's because we gravitate towards and try to insist on, quite frankly, working with candidates who consider who do business in a personal way. It's one mm-hmm. of the things that our business was founded to do. So maybe that's you know, more indicative of the kind of companies we work with. But I will say I'm rarely, if ever, disappointed by how people treat those situations. People are fair and reasonable. Yeah, the vast, vast majority of the time. It, it, and Pete, and that is spot on, because from my perspective, as somebody who interviews quite a bit, I will feel much better if somebody was up front with a situation that happened in the past, and I'm dealing with it up front, exactly how you said good news, uh, bad news early is good news. I, I Look, I'm the one who's looking to trust this new individual to come work for this organization. And if I'm able to validate that trust early on in the process, that's better for that person than later on. Now, if you're somebody that's worried about answering that question and you do it in a way that you know that if you answer it honestly, you're not going to get that job, then maybe you shouldn't be interviewing for that job, to be honest, right? right. If, if you're that worried about it. So I think we, you and I are both on the same sheet of music there. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw you for, I'm going to, I'm going to throw another hard one at you. Another curveball. I'm ready. So this is under the topic of irrelevant questions. Those come up, right? Sometimes they're goofy, <laughs> like, you know, sell me a pencil or there's some, there's something out there about a manhole cover. I, I don't know what that one is. Some Microsoft question that was asked for years, I think, right. um, to test your, your, who, who knows what I, I don't, I don't really subscribe to those kind of questions. Um, but then again, if Microsoft's doing it, it's probably not, maybe, maybe it's a good idea. Um, <laughs> what, what do you say if someone has asked something highly inappropriate? Um, you, know, you mentioned EEOC earlier, mm-hmm. you know, so let's just go there. From that perspective, something like, hey, Ricky, are you married? Um, we know that that shouldn't happen. Yeah. We know that it does happen. Since this is you know, podcast today is really focused on the candidate, what, do you, what advice do you have for candidates who, who were throwing a curveball like that? Ooh, and Pete, that definitely is a curveball, right? Because it's a, uh, we all know it, 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 that, especially being in HR, and it's, we know that those are questions that people are not supposed to ask. And as a candidate who gets asked that question, you're in a really pickle here, right? In a really pickle. I don't know what that means. You're in a real pickle here. Because if you, if you answer the question, you know that question has no relevancy into the, uh, into the job. But if you're if you don't answer the question saying I'm sorry that's an illegal question that might botch that interview. I've got a foolproof way how to answer that question and save the whole interview. So instead of saying if somebody asks me Ricky are you married, and instead of me saying that's irrelevant I don't know what that has to do with this interview that's an illegal question. Um, a better answer would be this: if somebody says Hey Ricky are you married. I would say, you know what, I don't think the answer to that question is going to convey how my skill set can help your organization. But let me tell you what is. Two years ago, I was working on this project where this thing happened in A, B, and C. Reroute. Reroute that question. Reroute. Bring it back. I, I was going to, you know, you, you said you have a foolproof way. That, that is setting the, you know, the bar pretty high for yourself. <laughs> But I have to, I have to give it to you. I think that's a great, that is the perfect answer to you know a question that shouldn't exist in the first place. And so, um, so I want to make sure that I understand what you're saying. You know, just or just we, it's worthy of, of further explanation just to make sure mm-hmm. everyone gets it. Yes. Acknowledge the question. Say that you know it, it's you. You don't believe that that's relevant to um, uh, to the role, or that. Hey, and rather than talk about that, right? I guess I, I'm, I'm even screwing this up. Not that you don't think it's relevant, but rather than talk about that, let me tell you something that I think is more important to my ability yes. to do the job. And then, and then just quickly go past it as if it, it wasn't asked at all. And in that setting, right? Now, what you do after that is, is, a, is a different discussion. But we're talking about in the interview itself, provided that it's not of a nature that you feel uncomfortable to the point where you should walk out. That's its own thing too. Yeah. But you know, in the moment, if 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 you want to just deflect and keep going, I think you've got the perfect solution. I really do. Thank you. I mean, it's it, it's it's a now. 
if they keep asking irrelevant questions more and more and more now it, it, it's you may have to ask yourself what am i getting myself into here right but you know it, it's i've been maybe in one situation maybe two in my 20 years in hr where an irrelevant question was asked um, in both of those situations, I was involved in the interview process as an observer, and I quickly redirected that manager. Um, but it, it's for, from an employee's perspective, uh, you know, for those organizations that just are not well versed into the EEOC guidelines, rerouting it from taking it away from that uncomfortable answer and bringing the interview right back on track is the best thing you can do to, uh, to keep those chances for you getting that job high. And we know that companies, you know, individual managers at various levels, you know, have various degrees of training exposure mm -hmm. into those things. And I'm sure every day um, those questions are asked when they shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can say that in, in, in almost every case, I'm confident that the employer, you know, doesn't know, nor would they want that happening, right? right. So, you know, usually it's 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 a one-off. It's someone who's who's gone rogue, so to speak. Uh, that their HR folks would would be none too pleased to find out about, right. right? Is that fair? <laughs> that, um, that is very fair. And, and so, if you are working with a recruiter, either a third party or a corporate recruiter, that's something you know, that I would recommend you know, bringing up after the fact, letting you know, and then. Among other things, you're going to see how the company reacts to it, right? Are they apologetic? Do they try to make up for it? Do they take action and 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 let you know what that action is? So, um, you know, you can't prevent problems from happening, and even the best you know companies, the best employers out there are going to you know do things that uh, aren't perfect at times. Yeah. How they make up for them is is perhaps you know as important, if not more important, than a lot of cases, right? And we're we're talking about degrees here. So we're, we're assuming, you know, the sake of this conversation that the, you know, it's inappropriate, not to the point of discomfort, because if, if you get faced, you know, dealing with that in an interview, you know, my advice would be vastly different, right? If you're ever uncomfortable um, you know, because of, you know, it's going down an inappropriate path, end it and leave, right? That, that to yeah. me is pretty cut and dry, right? Yep. Would you agree there? No, absolutely. It, it, it's a, <laughs> yeah. End it and leave because that, that, that way, you know, just how this is you making a good first impression for the organization, the opposite is true. They're, they, they're supposed to be putting their best foot forward to see if this is the right position for you, vice versa. So remember, that's interview goes both sides. So, so we got through the interview. We were prepared. We dealt with the surprises along the way. We, we, we were attentive. We, you know, enthusiastic. We said goodbye. We're saying goodbye. What, what, how do we close? So um, if you started out with the elbow bump, you finish off with the elbow bump, <laughs> right? And, and then you, you and then you go eat dinner at four. You go. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You know, early bro special, man. It's those those discounts really add up. Um, no. So you exit the interview. So what's next? What do you do next? So this is something that um, um, uh, in my class, uh, Pete, I I always ask my students, what do they rather see? Would they rather, after they finish interviewing somebody or everybody, and it's, do they rather see a thank you email or a thank you note? And let me tell you, Pete, everybody is split. There's no science behind it. To me, it's personal preference. Now, I know what I prefer. I want to hear what you prefer first. So It's not even close. Oh, really? It's not even close. It's a handwritten note 10 out of 10 times. Yes. Um, actually, I just saw a cartoon. Uh, about that uh, sometime over the weekend where it was, you know, showing, you know, in the past, right. I don't remember how it was portrayed, but in the past, someone was you know, kind of bummed out because they had a bunch of mail and then they started getting emails for the first time. It, I think it had dates on it, you know, so, you know, 1980, they had too much mail, 19, you know, 90, 95, whatever it was, they started getting email and that was exciting, right. 2000, you know, 20, you know, now you're inundated with email um, and, and you get too much. And so when you do get a handwritten note, it's meaningful, it, you know, it stands out. And for me, you know, I get um, you know, a few hundred unsolicited emails a day and um, most of them are instantly deleted or, or sent right to spam or already going to spam. But if I get a handwritten note of any type, um, I look at it differently. It tends to hang around my desk. I feel almost guilty throwing it out for reasons I can't explain. And I, I say this often because it's one of these you know, weird psychological things where I know that someone took 
time. I know that it was personal. I know that it was thoughtful. And um, boy, when you talk about a difference maker, you know, that that's a big one for me, you know, handwritten note yep. every time. And you know what, Pete, you talking about that cartoon you saw with all those males and everything. And I started thinking about like back in the day when I used to get those 10 cans of CD-ROMs from AOL telling me you got 10,000 free hours. Uh, it, it's that stopped. And we never really thought about it. Why that stopped? I, I bet if I look in my attic, I have about 80 million hours worth of AOL CDs in there. <laughs> there you but, go. But you know what? You and I are on the same sheet of music. I, I personally believe in the long lost art of a, of a personalized handwritten note. Here's why. Because in the world of email, and we talked about this earlier on the show, in the world of email with everything, we all have to be connected every day. Your emails get inundated and it's easy for something to get lost. And for me to delete or archive an email that at first glance I see it as irrelevant, it's a much easier task than getting something mailed to me, me opening it, and I'm like, oh, wow, somebody took the time to write me a thank you letter. It's harder for me to throw that out than deleting an email. It's it really weird, is. right? It's a <laughs> it thing. Really yeah. And I, I swear, Pete, I am not a mail hoarder. Uh, but when it comes to that, <laughs> I do have, I got stuff that I got from 10 years ago. I still have it. And my wife is wondering, why do you still have it? Because somebody took the time birthdays, graduations, whatever the case may be, somebody took the time to go to a store, come back home, write a letter, go to the post office, who does that anymore, and then send that to you. And you're right, it hangs around and it helps out. It really helps out to say, this is how this person presented themselves and is part of the overall package. To me, that's the really go-getter right there to get that personalized letter. So I'm with you 100%. And I would even go so far as to say, do it in the parking lot. Right. Ooh, Your yes. thoughts are fresh. It's there doing the parking lot, drop, you know, drop it off at the nearest mailbox on the way home. It'll, it'll yeah. odds are arrive the next day. Right. Uh, no, now you may be a mail hoarder though. I will say, <laughs> I mean, based, I know. <laughs> yeah. uh, that, if that's not the description, I'm not sure what it is, but, <laughs> but, uh, but, but, we're, but like you said, we're, we're in full agreement on, on that. I, I would love to hear the counter from your students, do you have, does anything immediately come to mind? What, you know, why they would recommend the email instead? Um, it, so with how they responded, it has a lot more to do of the generation we're in than anything else. Sure. Right. Um, so to them, it's just much easier and they haven't heard it, it's most of them never mailed a letter before. <laughs> right. Right? right. So, so, so to them an email is just, more logical and i understand that piece which to me it, it's if they get that aspect of it then they have to understand that if they think that way then everybody else who are their age in that generation they think that way as well nothing wrong with it it's just where they are in this generation more reason to stand out more reason yeah to you said it something different yeah it is easier yeah. That's why you do. That's why you do the hard thing, right? Yeah, and I mean, right. in, in, in almost every case in life, the easier thing is the thing that's you know less valuable, right? So do the hard thing, and I think that's a great way to close today. And um, you know, and because that's all uh, in line with what we've talked about is is put forth that extra effort ahead of time, which others won't be willing to do, and you're going to just greatly increase your chance for success in your in person interview. So. I think that's a that's a good uh, good way to end. What do you think? No, that is perfect. So that is so now again. Last week, last episode, we talked about getting ready for the interview. Now we're talking about in the interview. The interview is over and done with. You're driving home. You're dropping that letter off in the mail. What's next, Pete? What are we talking about next episode? Well, what's next? You're gonna get the job offer if you do all that stuff. But we're <laughs> gonna go. We're gonna go a little Q and A. Uh, we're Ooh, starting to get yes. some questions. You know, yes. and please email us higher calling at fourcornerresources.com or you can visit fourcornerresources.com on our website under our resources tab we do list all of our podcasts and now we're even putting up the videos so um, between the audio transcript and video everything's there we would love feedback uh, we're um, you know really looking to provide content that uh, is beneficial to not only candidates but to uh, hiring managers hr professionals as well as other recruiters so Hit us up with questions, challenges, challenge us as best you can. We'll talk about the hard stuff. Um, sometimes I'll defer to Ricky on the hard HR stuff. But uh, as far as you know, anything related to hiring, staffing, and recruiting, 
we think you're, you know, we want to be a resource for that. So hit us up anytime and we will answer your questions. That's right. And also we are available on your favorite podcast platform. So please go, whether you're Apple, Google, whatever the case may be, go find us, Higher Calling Podcast, download us, subscribe, give us a like, give us a review. We love to hear what you think about the show. We would really appreciate it. All, All right, right, man. That's it for today then. So Roger that. All right, folks. That's it for this episode. Until next time, drive safe. Good night. Goodbye for now. Yeah.